Hello, for this video, I'm going to talk about synovial joints and how we classify them. Okay, so uh, bones are covered by articular cartilage, uh, which as I've mentioned before, uh, articular cartilage is made of hyaline cartilage, which is just a type of cartilage. Um, so it's smooth, kind of bluish, uh, reduces friction. That's why it's located there. A joint capsule is composed of two layers. There's a fibrous membrane and a synovial membrane. So if we look at this picture here, uh, that outer blue and the purple, that is all fibrous membrane. Um, so it's very tough and dense and protective. And then that red little bit, that little red layer that is lining the inside of the fibrous membrane is the synovial membrane. Okay, so the synovial membrane is the deep layer of areolar connective tissue and articular fat pads. Uh, areolar connective tissue is kind of fluffier. It's not as dense, like we've talked a lot about dense, regular, and irregular connective tissue. Um, so it's not nearly as tough. It's a lot less collagen. Uh, it's more like reticular fibers and elastic fibers that make it kind of more cotton candy-like, as gross as that may sound. Um, but it's, it's just fluffier um, and not as tough and dense. Uh, it also contains articular fat pads there. So they're just like little pads of fat, exactly what it sounds like, uh, that offer some cushioning and protection inside of the joint. So uh, when people start uh, losing weight in unhealthy ways, like where they're not eating or um, they're doing like extreme dieting or supplements or things like that where they're losing fat in unhealthy ways or too quickly. Uh, sometimes they'll start losing some of the structural fat in the body instead of their fat stores that they're actually trying to target. Um, and so some of the structural fat in the body that would include like articular fat pads. Um, and so somebody who's in that scenario or who's going through weight loss like that, uh, they might start having aches and pains and joints that they didn't have before. And it could be, it could be dehydration, but it also could be that they're um, eating away at their fat pads instead of at the appropriate fat stores that they want to be targeting. Um, and so usually that can easily be reversed once they go back to a healthy diet and lifestyle. Um, but something to consider if someone's joints are hurting while they're trying to lose weight and maybe in not the best ways. Uh, so synovial membranes secrete synovial fluid. Uh, so you can see that red layer that shows the synovial membrane. It is secreting synovial fluid that fills up that synovial cavity, that space between the bones. And um, then the fibrous membrane, that is the outer part, it's superficial layer of dense irregular connective tissue, uh, attaches directly to the periosteum of the bone. Okay, so uh, the bones are covered in periosteum in adults or perichondrium in children, and the fibrous membrane of the synovial joints is going to enclose the joint completely and then attach directly to the periosteum. Okay, then we have accessory ligaments, which are bundles of collagen fibers. Um, all of our synovial joints have ligaments. They could be inside, outside, or part of the capsule itself. So some of our ligaments, although we name and describe them as being independent of the, the synovial capsule, a lot of them are actually portions of the capsule itself. They're actually embedded in the capsule. Uh, so keep in mind that the joint capsule is dense, irregular connective tissue. So the collagen is going in all kinds of directions. But in some places, the collagen all lines up and goes in the same direction. And where that happens, that's where we would call that a ligament. Because in that location, even though it's part of the capsule, uh, that particular part would be dense, regular connective tissue, which is a ligament. Um, then we also could have bundles of collagen fibers, so ligaments, uh, that are completely inside the joint capsule or that are completely outside the joint capsule, neither that are embedded in the capsule itself. Um, articular discs are pads of fibrocartilage, so kind of tough, dense cartilage, different from hyaline cartilage. Uh, so we have them in many of our joints. They're between articular surfaces. 
Um, it helps give more cushioning and, and padding to a joint. Uh, it includes labrums, menisci, and lots of others. So a labrum or a meniscus, those are just two specific names of articular discs that are inside certain joints. So like labrums we have in our ball and socket joints, that's our glenohumeral and our acetabulofemoral joints. Uh, and the menisci we only have in the knees. And then we have other articular discs in lots of other joints throughout the body. Like we have them in our sternoclavicular joints up here. We have them in lots of different places. Um, they help make the bones of the joint more congruent. So you'll hear me use that word here and there. Um, anytime we talk about a joint being congruent, what we're saying is that the two bones fit together the best. Um, so where two bones make an articulation, they will fit together like puzzle pieces in some positions, like they'll fit together really well in some positions and they'll fit together a lot less. So the bones are just kind of near each other in other positions. So when the bones fit and have the most congruency, we would say they fit together the best. Um, so if they don't fit together very well, the joint is not very congruent. Um, so like, for example, the glenohumeral joint, if I go into this position where my glenohumeral joint is abducted and externally rotated, that is the most congruent position of that joint. That is the position where the joint capsule is pulled taut and the bones fit together the best. In all other positions, it's less congruent than in that position. So one of the important functions of an articular disc that in any joint in the body is to help the bones fit together better, makes the joint more congruent. Um, because it's more congruent, it also increases the stability. And they act as shock absorbers. So like in the knees, for example, uh, the menisci help absorb shock of impact going through that joint. So the, the forces that are traveling through that joint when we're weight bearing, um, thankfully we have menisci that help us absorb that shock and absorb those forces so that it's not just all going right into the hyaline cartilage, the articular cartilage and into the bone. A bursa is a sac-like cushion. It's just like a little bubble of fluid, like a little pocket of fluid. Uh, they're actually made of uh, like a synovial membrane sort of. They're like little membranous sac um, where the sac part secretes fluid into its middle to make like a little fluid cushion. Uh, their job is to reduce friction between two structures. So we have them everywhere. We have them between um, tendons and bones, between tendons and muscle, between tendon and tendon, between skin and bone. We have them anywhere where two structures are rubbing against each other and it would cause friction. We have a bursa in between to help kind of absorb that friction, to reduce the friction between those two structures so that we don't have constant inflammation and injury of those structures. So we have them everywhere. Um, when a bursa is healthy and normal, you shouldn't be able to palpate it. So you shouldn't be able to touch it with your fingers. It should be basically unfeelable, <laughs> unpalpable. Um, so like you have one on the, right on the tip of your elbow. So if you feel the tip of your elbow, all you should feel is skin against bone and maybe a little bit of your um, tricep tendon, depending on exactly where you're feeling. Um, but if you ever touch the tip of your elbow and it feels kind of swollen or like there's something bulging there, what you're feeling is an inflamed bursa. So you shouldn't feel that. Um, and so like if you fell right on the tip of your elbow and had like an impact there, that's a way to inflame that particular bursa. And it can actually blow up like a, like a baseball right there. It's really crazy looking, but um, then it, it resolves itself. Uh, so we'll talk more. That's bursitis. We'll talk about bursitis uh, later on in the course when we start going joint by joint and talking about different injuries and, and pathologies. Okay, physiological classifications are based on the movements they allow. So depending on whether a joint allows motion in just one plane or on one axis, that would be uniaxial, 
two planes around two axes, biaxial, three planes around three axes, triaxial. Um, now, if a joint is biaxial or triaxial, it also includes all of the movement that could happen in oblique planes that are kind of a, an amalgamation of those actions that it does allow. Um, so like a biaxial joint, even if it can't move in that third plane, it includes the motion on those two planes plus whatever can occur in between those two planes, just not on the third plane. Okay, our anatomical classification. So again, we classify everything based on its function, that was the physiological, and then based on its structure. So that's the anatomical. So based on structure, we have six classifications, hinge joints, pivot joints, condyloid joints, saddle joints, ball and socket, and a plane or a gliding joint. There are also other names for these joints. So you may have called them something different when you covered this in anatomy. Um, but these are the most commonly used terms. These are the ones I like, so that's what I'm sharing with you here. So our uniaxial synovial joints, the types of joints that only can move in one plane around one axis, um, first we have our hinge joints. Um, so those are only capable of flexion and extension. Uh, that's like the elbow and the knee. Then we have a pivot joint. Uh, only can do rotation around the length of the bone. So that's like the atlantoaxial joint or the radial ulnar joints. Um, so I put a picture here of the atlantoaxial joint all the way on the top there. Uh, it's an overview. Um, so the atlantoaxial joint, that's the articulation between C1 and C2, at, um, atlas and axis. Um, so you can see that um, atlas, that's C1, is rotating around the little peg, the dens, that sticks up from axis, the C2. So that just kind of rotation around that peg there, that is an example of a pivot joint. Um, also, the superior and inferior radial ulnar joints, those are both examples of pivot joints where they just rotate around each other to cause uh, pronation and supination of the forearm. Okay, then we have our biaxial synovial joints, so the two types that allow movement in two planes. Uh, we have condyloid joints that are capable of flexion extension and abduction and adduction. Okay, so flexion extension, that's sagittal plane movement, abduction, adduction, that's frontal plane movement. Um, and then one always dominates. So a good example is like the radiocarpal joint. So the articulation between radius and the carpals of the wrist. Um, so flexion extension, that's the dominant movement. And then add an abduction, although that joint is capable of those actions, uh, it's much less dominant. Um, so flexion extension, it's significantly more dominant then add an abduction. So those are our two um, planes of movement there. Okay, and then a saddle joint, that's our other biaxial joint, uh, capable of flexion and extension and abduction and adduction. And a good example of that would be our trapezial metacarpal joint. Um, that's our, the joint um, between trapezium, the carpal right here, and then our first, uh, metacarpal, and that's what we see in the bottom picture there. Okay, then our triaxial synovial joints. First, of course, is a ball and socket. Uh, we only have two examples of ball and socket joints in the body. That is the glenohumeral joint of the shoulder and the acetabulofemoral joint of the hip. Uh, it allows motion in all three planes and everything in between. Um, so it has the greatest range, those two joints have the greatest range of motion of any joints in the body. Uh, usually the glenohumeral has greater range of motion than the acetabulofemoral, uh, and that's because of the design of the joint. Uh, the acetabulofemoral has a much deeper socket, which restricts its range of motion compared to the glenohumeral. Uh, but that also means that the glenohumeral is a lot less stable and prone to injury um, because it has a much more shallow socket, like it's hardly a socket at all. 
Uh, and then a plane or a gliding joint, you'll hear both terms used synonymously equally, um, equally often, and it's referring to the same thing. Um, so they can actually be biaxial or triaxial. So I included them here because they're more commonly triaxial than biaxial, um, but they actually could be either. Um, so it only allows gliding motion but it allows gliding motion in two or three planes, which would make it bi or triaxial. So if it's triaxial, its movement would look like this. It either can go side to side, front to back, or in a rotation like that. All three of those are gliding actions, but they're just gliding that could take place in three different planes. Um, so an example would be the acromial clavicular joint. So articulation between the acromion process of the scapula and the, the, the acromial end of the clavicle. So up at the top of the shoulder here. All right, so that's all I have for you in this snippet. And I'll see you for the next one.